welcome to this evidence session from the Committee on Standards in Public Life. Before I uh, introduce our expert witnesses this morning, I'd just like to say a word about the committee and the inquiry that we are currently undertaking. The committee was founded in 1994 by the gen then Prime Minister, Sir John Major, uh, and it was a report which uh, focused on arrangements for upholding ethical standards of conduct in public life that led to the establishment of this committee. The initial committee under Lord Nolan formulated the seven principles of public life, of selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty, and leadership, which set out universal standards for conduct in public life. And this committee continues to own and promote those principles. We're not a regulator. We don't field complaints or comment on the outcome of individual cases but we advise the Prime Minister and government of the day on the processes, procedures and regulation in place to uphold high standards of conduct. And we promote best practice on maintaining high standards within public sector organisations. For the committee's 25th anniversary in 2019, we decided to take a step back and commissioned an academic research piece mapping the complex landscape of standards bodies which has emerged over the last 25 years and following that we decided to launch a review analyzing the strengths and weaknesses of our current standards arrangements. The committee has done this before but not since 2013 when we published our report Standards Matter. We're taking an overall look at how well ethical standards are upheld in public life, looking at any potential gaps and weaknesses in our standards regulators and we'll be producing some best practice guidance. That brings me to this morning's session. And it's been clear for some time that one area of public concern in our current standards arrangements is the functioning of the ministerial code and the role of the independent advisor on ministers interests. I'm delighted today that we have two former independent advisors joining us, Sir Alex Allen and Sir Philip Moore. Sir Alex was the independent advisor from 2012 until 2020, following a distinguished career in the civil service. Sir Philip served as the independent advisor from 2008 to 2012, following six years as parliamentary commissioner for standards and senior roles in the Church of England and the Home Office. Joining us from the committee today, uh, we have Manisha Shah, one of our independent members, uh, Dr. Jane Martin, an independent member, and the Right Honourable Jeremy Wright, MP, a political member uh, from the Conservative Party. And we have uh, apologies from Dame Shirley Pierce, Lord Stunnell, and Dame Margaret Beckett. We're live streaming the session to the committee's YouTube channel, and I would remind all watching that the committee is not asking for the outcomes of any recent or past casework. Uh, nor are any issues currently being examined by the courts. So welcome, uh, Sir Alex and Sir Philip. Thank you very much indeed for being with us this morning. I'd like to start with a, a wide question really, which is, do you feel confident that public standards have been maintained by ministers in recent years? And do you see any trend in adherence to standards over time? And we might perhaps start with Sir Alex. Well, <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Evans, for um, inviting us to this session. Uh, in terms of has there been a trend in standards, um, I think that's very hard to say. Um, certainly there have been concerns which have fluctuated over the years, and I think more recently obviously have been amplified by social media. But I thought you put it well in your UK lecture recently when you said it's unrealistic to think there's ever been a scandal-free golden age of British politics. But I do recognise the concerns that have been uh, put forward recently, and again, some of which you've quoted in your lecture. Um, and I do think that it is important that we have ministerial leadership on standards right across the board, and including, obviously, for ministers themselves. And of course, as you said, it was John Major's initiative to set up what was the Nolan Committee and is now the Standards Committee on Standards in Public Life. So um, I, I do think that uh, ministerial code is very important. And I do think that uh, the upholding of it is equally important. 
Thank you. So, Philip, what's your perspective on this? I think if you look um, historically, um, you could argue that the workings of government, um, in particular, because that's today's focus, are more transparent now and the system of regulation more developed and so on. So in that sense, uh, we're better placed than um, in the past. And there's certainly plenty of historical evidence of um, things that would be unacceptable today um, uh, in terms of ministers' conduct. That said, I very strongly agree with um, Alex that these things fluctuate um, and they're affected by not only social developments, but also political circumstances often. I mean, there is a to always a temptation for um, new administrations or, and prime ministers who are particularly strong in their position to think that uh, what I say goes. It's a temptation in the, um, in the way of all prime ministers, I think, and one which um, uh, is best resisted. And I um, entirely endorse what Alex said about the importance of leadership in these matters. At the end of the day, clear and consistent leadership is what is needed to ensure that strong and high standards are maintained. On the, on the theme of leadership, of course, is one of the seven principles. Um, how do you think that can best be undertaken? Uh, I mean, standards leadership is a slightly, um, uh, could be a slightly fuzzy issue. So what does it mean to provide leadership in standards in a political environment? Alex, you go first. Should I go first? Yes, you go. Um, well, I, I think that, first of all, setting uh, in, uh, high standards is very important. Uh, and clearly, ministers often have a role in uh, determining standards in other parts of the public sector. Uh, and I think it's very important, as I said, that they show leadership in that. And, I mean, it's also important that they do show uh, a commitment to the standards that apply to them. I mean, clearly uh, that applies to ministers in the Commons in terms of the parliamentary code, and it applies to ministers in particular for the ministerial code. And I mean, my experience is that ministers do take the code seriously. And uh, there are lots of issues where ministers consult uh, either the uh, their own department, their permanent secretaries, or sometimes the cabinet office about such issues. And they are taken seriously. And I think that is really important in terms of demonstrating leadership on standards issues. Yeah, I, I'd simply stress the, uh, the need for clear and consistent leadership, both in personal example and in terms of uh, what government says about the standards that it expects, and the Prime Minister in particular says about the standards he expects of his ministers and those who work for him. Um, uh, Alex is right that a lot of the work that goes on on these matters is, is, is below the radar. Um, between the cabinet office, right in ethics team and so on, and uh, individual government uh, ministers. Um, and and that's, that's right and understandable. Um, but occasionally, of course, these matters do come to the surface and, uh, and for one reason or another. And in those circumstances, then a clear line from the top is essential. Do you think that <laughs> we've obviously been going through I'm which genuinely, I'm always rather sceptical of people who talk about crises, but you know, the last 18 months has undoubtedly been a period of crisis. Do you think that that puts pressure on standards issues? Philip, do you want to start? Um, well, I would say it was more important that uh, uh, standards are maintained in a time of crisis. I think there's obviously, as you say, a temptation to feel, oh God, the uh, problems we're facing are such that let's just... Uh, you know, forget about some of the constraints and let's cut corners, which I think is very dangerous. And so I do think that uh, maintaining standards, knowing what uh, must be done in those terms in a crisis is really important. Sorry, I cut across. For no, as I entirely agree. I mean, crises are no excuse for poor behaviour. Thank you. If we could come on to the specifics of the advisor's role uh, later in the, it, we will do later in the conversation, but in terms of the ministerial code, which aspects of that do you think have been more successful and where have, they, have any problems arisen? Because it's a, slightly, uh, it's a slightly strange document mixing both ethical and practical guidance. 
Also, if I, I, if I'd come in first, I'd say the most successful part has been the greater transparency that's been brought about. There's much more publication now of all the relevant information relating to the code. I mean, not just the um, publication of ministers' interests, which is where the advisor is most closely engaged, but also the quarterly publication of gifts to ministers, of hospitality, of travel, of meetings for all ministers. And I think that's really important. I, I mean, another aspect is that it, it's important and I think successful in preventing problems arising in the first place. And uh, as Philip said, an awful lot goes on under the radar and uh, there's lots of consultation, um, uh, including sometimes consultation with the advisor about issues under the ministerial code. So I, I think that all that is the most successful part. Um, I think it's clear as we're going to come on to that some of the most problematic are the issue of investigations and the role of the advisor. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that and um, I'm, we'll come on later to areas in which um, there could be improvement. So I leave it there for now. So uh, it sounds as though you would say that in general ministers do understand what is required and do want to comply rather than seeing this as you know, a necessary compliance measure that they grudgingly have to put up with. Um, yes, and uh, um, there's a powerful, um, there are various powerful reasons why they want to comply. I mean, they want to comply because generally they're good people. They want to try to do their best in complex and difficult circumstances. And they want to comply because they, the last thing they want to do is see a headline in the Daily Mail that says that they've been, you know, doing no, up to no good. So there are and quite a part, of course, from the activities of watchdogs like yourselves. <laughs> so there are strong incentives for compliance. Um, but I, uh, for the most part, you know, ministers are anxious to, 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 to deliver for the best of motives and best of reasons. Alex, do you want to well, I wouldn't pretend that there aren't occasions when ministers feel irked when they're told that something they would want to do is not compatible with the ministerial code. Uh, and that's something which is uh, we've said is normally discussed first of all with the department, then sometimes with the propriety and ethics team in the cabinet's office, and then sometimes with the advisor. Um, but as Philip said, I mean, our experience is that uh, at the end of the day, ministers are keen to adhere to the code and do follow the guidance that's provided for them. Do you think that there are standards expectations for ministers that go further than those for others in politics and in public life? Should it be more demanding on ministers in terms of high standards? Uh, well, it, well it, 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 it is actually, um, in a sense, already, um, because, um, uh, of course, the ministers are subject to far more stringent rules in relation, for example, to conflicts of interest than, than our members of parliament. And that's right, because the potential for conflicts of interest is higher um, if you occupy a ministerial post in which you may ultimately be signing off contracts or agreeing to contracts for uh, large sums of public money. And, and of course, you wield a good deal of patronage as well in that position. So um, uh, there, are good, there are reasons, good reasons of that sort, as it were, why expectations are, if you like, higher or rules are more stringent anyway. Um, I think it's also right because ministers occupy um, a prominent public role. I mean, they're constantly in the eyes of the media and they, they therefore set an example um, uh, uh, or have the opportunity to set an example for good or bad in a very prominent way. And the final point I'd make is that they're ultimately um, uh, uh, responsible for large organisations like the NHS or the armed services or, or the police or whatever, and, and, and they set a tone. Um, and uh, there's no doubt that those in the organisations under the department for which they're responsible do take note of that. Um, so for all those reasons, um, I think, you know, we're right to expect high standards of ministers and uh, um, uh, arguably tougher ones than, um, than, than would apply to people in every other, you know, if in, in other walks of, um, of public life, the elevated expectations, I think, in that sense. Alex? 
Um, I've nothing to add to that. I thought Philip put it very well. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Jane Martin. Um, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good, Good morning, morning, Sir Alex and Sir Philip. Um, I've got uh, three sort of questions around the specifics of the nature and status of the code. And uh, we'd be interested to hear from you in a moment about the sort of hybridity of the document uh, and issues around who owns the code. But can I start by uh, asking you about the status of the code? Um, you know, given public expectation, is the status of the code clear enough to the public and to ministers? There does seem to be some confusion as to whether it's a codified you know, constitutional document or whether it's just merely well-intentioned guidance. Um, Sir Alex, perhaps first. Well, uh, I, I mean, I agree that the status isn't actually clear. I mean, I think it's more than just well-intentioned guidance, but not really what you'd say was part of the constitution. But I, I think most people probably aren't quite concerned about the details of its status. But I mean, regard it as something that ministers must and should follow. I mean, th this is um, something that was been, has been discussed quite a lot in the past. Uh, and I mean, I thought John Major put it very well in a, a appearance before the Public Administration Select Committee, I think it was back in the 2000s, when he said that while it's constitutionally correct to say an incoming government can tear it up and begin again, I think that's unlikely to the point of being dismissed. Um, and I, I mean, as I say, it does have an, uh, a slightly ambiguous state, uh, status, though how much that matters, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's certainly interesting that it's never been tested, as far as I know, in the courts, whether they take account of some of the provisions in the code, if that was relevant in a particular case. Thank you. And Sir Philip, on this particular point. I don't think there's a lot to add um, there. I mean, the strength of the code lies in the fact that, as Alex has said, every prime minister is expected to produce one and having produced it, own it. Um, and that's where it divides its uh, its authority, if you like. Sure. I mean, just to just to follow that particular point up. I mean, clearly um, there are times when it, it there is a sense that ministers should be held directly accountable, um, you know, th through the code in some way. Uh, I mean, what do you feel about that point? You know, should be ministers just be held to account by the electorate, as it were, or um, you know, is it important that they are held to account through uh, this form of regulation? Um, um, well, yeah, they are held to account through the code. Um, they are held to account um, within departments by, you know, permanent secretaries and the cabinet secretary, uh, um, uh, and they're held to account ultimately um, with the help of the advisor by the prime minister of the day. So absolutely. I, d I think you also need to understand that the ministerial code has a function beyond purely ethical considerations. It's, it's uh, how... how it's, it's part of the mechanisms by which a prime minister and the cabinet secretary actually order, if you like, the conduct of cabinet government. So it's, it's, it's not just um, performing an ethical function and, and the other function I mentioned shouldn't be under, you know, shouldn't be ignored. Sure. So Alex, Alex, at that point, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I, I think Philip's covered it, thank you. Okay. Well, let me go on to the point then that Sir Philip has highlighted, which is sort of about the hybridity of the document. Um, I mean, it does cover procedures for cabinet government as well as direction on ethics and, and propriety, as you've just um, mentioned. I, is that a good thing that one document covers both or is that adding to the confusion? Well, uh, I mean, that's it's interesting because the ministerial code grew out of a, a document called Questions of Procedure for Ministers, which I think was first uh, circulated by... Prime Minister in 1945 and has um, continued down the years since then. And uh, John Major was the first person to pub first Prime Minister to publish it uh, in 1992. And then it was Tony Blair who uh, took it forward and renamed it the Ministerial Code. And I mean, it's it's very interesting. I look back and some of the material in the current code, which was issued in by the Prime Minister in 2019 is I almost identical word for word with some of the material in the early codes in the 50s, for example. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the, two, the nature of the code, um, it is a, um, one of the things that your committee recommended was that it should be split into a section with a, 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 the guidance in one side and the ethics in another side. And indeed, 
following the recommendation, Tony Blair did split it into two sections in 2005 after the election, when he had a ministerial code of ethics and a procedural guidance for ministers. Gordon Brown then looked at it afresh when he came in in 2007 and simplified the code and shortened it. So it was then 23 pages as opposed to 43 pages. Um, but that did away with the split again. Um, so, um, I, I mean, I think that it's, this is something that's fluctuated over the years. Um, uh, as Philip said, it is a hybrid docu document at the moment. And certainly the guidance on conducting cabinet government is it's important it should be in somewhere in a document that's uh, uh, published. Um, I mean, personally, I think quite a lot of it belongs in what was the cabinet manual, which is something that the government published in, I think it was 2011. And um, I, I, I mean, I felt, I'm rather disappointed that it seems to have uh, fallen by the wayside and hasn't been updated since then. Um, so Alex, if I may just uh, stick with that with you for a moment, if I may. Uh, so, I mean, you're, you're raising, you, you obviously set out the way in which different prime ministers um, um, deal with the code. Uh, do, do you think that that kind of political guidance, perhaps on um, you know day-to-day -day governing, undermines the authority of the code on ethics and propriety? I mean, I just wanted to push that point. And secondly, some have said, you know, there's a, such an inconsistency between the ministerial code and the code of conduct for ministers. You know, could it be that uh, if, we, if that were to be looked at again, that ministers should be subject to the MP's code of conduct on issues of ethics and propri propriety if they were to be split? Well, I mean, first of all, um, Commons ministers are subject to the MP's code of conduct uh, already. Um, so, that, I mean, they're subject to both. Uh, and, I mean, there are quite a substantial differences of focus between the two. I mean, both codes, of course, do s highlight the seven principles of public life that your committee uh, is responsible for. But, I mean, they do cover different things. I mean, the ministerial code covers issues like collective responsibility, public appointments, relations between ministers and civil servants, and the parliamentary code covers things like paid advocacy and uh, parliamentary expenses. So they, there is a, uh, a slightly different focus for the two, though inevitably there's some overlap. And as I say, ministers in the Commons are subject to the parliamentary code. Understand. Sir Philip, would you like to add anything to this area? Uh, just a couple of points. Um, first, for me, the, the key issue is um, uh, would splitting the code in the way that's been described improve the effectiveness of the maintenance of the regulation of standards? Um, I'm, you know, I'm not sure about that. Um, I actually think it may be helpful to have ministers to have in a relatively short document all the things they really need to know about and the principles which um, are enunciated at, at each, the beginning of each section clearly set out. So, you know, I have an open mind about it, but I do have a clear view about um, uh, making, putting all the ethical material into the House of Commons code and then saying, you know, the, all the relevant parliamentary codes and then, and, and that is that I, I think that would blur the line between the executive and 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 and, and the legislature. And, and I do think it's important that the, the, at the end of the day, the prime minister says what he expect or she expects the ministers of, um, in a government to um, to do and how, the, how how they should behave. So I've I've, I've got reservations. I, my questions are: A, would it be any more effective if it was split? And B, what would it do to the relationship between the executive and legislature? Thank you. So <laughs> just uh, finally, from me, just to go back, perhaps to Sir Alex to the point that uh, Sir Philip has, has just started to outline about who owns the code. You know, you both from your uh, from your responses explained the role of the Prime Minister in this. And of course, we understand that completely. Um, so just to sort of sharpen up the question to Sir Alex, I mean, should the code be laid before the House of Commons? Do you, do you share this view that we should be careful about blurring the line? Should there be greater parliamentary oversight of the code? Well, uh, I mean, there is in some ways parliamentary oversight of the code at the moment in that the prime minister is answerable to parliament. He can get asked, does get asked about it in prime minister's questions when he appears before the liaison, liaison committee and so on. And the and civil, uh, civil servants and indeed the independent advisor, him or herself, uh, appears before 
select committees and can be queried, asked about the code and issues under the code. So, I mean, I do think that uh, there is parliamentary involvement in how the code develops. Uh, I mean, I, I think that, as Sir Philip has said, there is an important difference between uh, a ministerial code dealing with the executive and a parliamentary code dealing with the legislature. And um, so, and, and I think ultimately it's very important that it's the prime minister who determines the standards that he expects of his ministers. And clearly it's for parliament to determine the standards that are expected of members of parliament. Thank you very much. Um, that's all for me at the moment. I think Jeremy is going to follow on. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Good morning and thank you both for, for joining us. I want to focus, if I may, on individual investigations into alleged breaches of the ministerial code by the independent advisor and perhaps ask you both, first of all, to talk us through how such investigations are initiated. So Alex, perhaps you can start and then I'll ask Sir Philip. Well, I mean, I don't think I can say much more than really is in the code itself, where it says that if there's an allegation about a breach, the Prime Minister, having consulted the Cabinet Secretary, feels it warrants further investigation, he may ask the Cabinet Office to investigate the facts of the case and or refer the matter to the independent advisor. Uh, and so, I mean, that is the process that's followed. I think it's absolutely right that the Cabinet Secretary should be the first port of call. Uh, in many cases, the issues are quite straightforward, either they're trivial or they're so serious that uh, there isn't really a need for a further investigation. Um, and I mean, then some of the issues about uh, the role of the independent advisor, I imagine, will come on to in a moment. I, I mean, it's quite interesting, the Scottish and Welsh codes, which have, have a lot in common with the uh, United Kingdom code, and the Scottish code is almost identical on this aspect, which it says, where he or she deems it appropriate, the first minister may refer matters to the independent advisors on the ministerial code. They have more than one advisor in Scotland. The Welsh one has a slightly different twist. It says the first minister will refer complaints regarding ministerial conduct to an independent advisor <laughs> unless he is satisfied the complaints can be responded to more immediately or routinely. So there is a difference there. Thank you. So, Philip, did you want to add something to the, the process, first of all? No, the process is, is as Alex has described it. Um, whether it needs changing or not, um, uh, Matthew may be coming on to. I certainly will. Uh, yes, I, I will be very interested in your view on that. But can I, can I then probe a little bit in, in the process? Uh, from the way you've described it, Sir Alex, it sounds like you are essentially waiting to be asked as an independent advisor. Is there any scope for you to ask yourself for the initiation of an investigation? I appreciate there'll be many circumstances in which you would not know that a complaint has been raised. But if you do, are you in positions to ask for an investigation to be commenced? Or do you have to wait to be asked yourselves? Well, I think as I've, I've set out the formal position, uh, you can only carry, as, a, it, as an advisor it stands at the moment, you can only carry out an investigation if you're asked by the Prime Minister following Cabinet Secretary's views. Um, I mean, clearly, I, I, I did have quite a lot of contact with the, uh, with the propriety and ethics team in the Cabinet Office and you know, discussed some of the issues that had arisen. So, um, I mean, it's not completely sort of sitting back and uh, you know, just waiting around, um, but it, 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 the position is clearly that, uh, that it's the Prime Minister who decides whether or not there should be an investigation. So, so the formal initiation comes from the Prime Minister and that's as it must be, but there's the possibility for some discussion of the issue before that formal initiation. Is that that position? Yes. Thank you. So, Philip, anything to add on that? Well, that, that is the current position. Um, yeah. I agree with Alex that we don't, um, you know, the advisor doesn't just sit there, as it were, um, having read the headlines in the newspaper and not make some inquiries of the propriety and ethics team as to what's happening and whether there's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, ultimately, uh, the position currently is as you've uh, heard from Alex and... Uh, um, 
Thank, thank you. Yes, I think so you ask the next question. <laughs> I, I shall. I, just one other thing on on the existing position. Then I promise we'll, we'll come to how how it might change in your view. Um, it follows, therefore, from what you've both said, does it that the independent advisor doesn't have the capacity to say, "I do not think this is something worth investigating." In terms of the initiation of the investigation, I, I'm not predicting where you might come to at the end, but do you have the option of saying, I do not wish to investigate what you've asked me to investigate? I don't think that's ever arisen. Um, no. So um, I don't know really what the position would be if, if, you're, if you were faced with that. Um, I, I'm sure it will be a something issue you discuss with the Cabinet Office. Uh, and uh, made your views clear, and that might or might not uh, influence whether the Prime Minister did actually formally ask you to conduct an investigation. Uh, um, understood. So, so the question, as you, uh, as you refer to, that we must ask next is, do you believe that the independent advisor should have the capacity to initiate their own investigations without waiting formally to be asked? What is your view on that? So, Philip, perhaps if you start, and then I'll ask Sir Alex. Well, you, you, I'm not sure whether Alex and I will um, are in agreement or not on this, but uh, I mean, my, my view is that the independent advisor should be able to in, initiate an investigation. Um, um, at the very least, that there should be um, more frequent reference to the um, independent advisor. Um, uh, I, I made my views on this uh, known when I was... Uh, uh, in, you know, gave evidence to an inquiry by uh, PASC, as it then was, um, the Parliamentary Administration, the Public Administration Select Committee in 2012. Um, my own view is that the um, advisor has a, um, uh, um, can actually help in the uh, helps distance really quite difficult decisions from uh, the Prime Minister and the Cabinet Secretary because of their independence and so on. Um, and uh, uh, so I would personally favour um, the, putting the independent advisor in a similar position to the parliamentary commissioner for standards who does decide whether or not to initiate an investigation um, and also decides um, uh, to some degree, you know, w whether the investigation needs to be full one, whether the matter is relatively trivial and can be dismissed without... Uh, um, uh, without um, more than an apology or whatever. There, as you know, there is a, a, a range of sanctions and available under the parliamentary process. And I think um, my own feeling is that the, the role of an independent advisor um, could have been more, um, could have been used more uh, uh, productively, more positively um, in order to strengthen arrangements in this respect within government um, than um, it was certainly during my time. And I made my views on that matter clear to the then Cabinet Secretary, as I did to PASC subsequently. Yes, thank you very much. Sir Alex, do you share that view? Well, uh, uh, I mean, Philip was uh, implying that I didn't share that view. Um, and yeah, no. I think that's not quite right. I, I've, um, um, I think there actually is a case now uh, for uh, giving the independent advisor the role of initiating investigations. I think the issue really now is whether the process that we talked about a moment ago is actually damaging to the perception of whether ministers do or don't adhere to the code. I mean, there are allegations of breaches that are essentially trivial or without substance, but there have also been incidents which prima facie appear to involve a breach of the code, but which haven't been referred to the independent advisor. I mean, it's perfectly possible that an investigation would have revealed that the allegations weren't supported by the facts. But the way the allegations have been dismissed, I, I think, has raised questions about the operation of the system and about public confidence or the confidence the public can have in the the impact and effectiveness of the code. So to that extent, I do see uh, a case for introducing a greater element of independence. I mean, it would also clear up, for example, the anomaly where there were allegations against the Prime Minister him or herself, which is something, of course, we've just seen in Scotland. Um, and um, I think, as Philip said, it would help the Prime Minister because it would stand between 
him or her and the complainers and the independent advisor would then take some of the flack in cases where he or she decided there wasn't a case to investigate or investigated and said no further action needed to be taken. Um, so, uh, but one thing I do think is important is that uh, whatever happens, it must be the prime minister who retains the decision on what action to take uh, yeah. once an investigation has taken place. I mean, it's the prime minister who, uh, if there's an argument about whether or not a minister should resign, it's his role to decide who he wants to have in his government. Yes, thank you. And we, we will come on a, a little later to, to the question of sanctions, but that's that's a useful um, contribution on that. Uh, just to um, to be clear, because you've both been um, very, very um, eloquent earlier about your belief that, generally speaking, ministers comply with the code and there are good reasons why they should and want to. Um, can I just check, in so far as your, your view on the initiation of investigations is concerned, you've talked about public confidence. Is it your view that ministerial behaviour would be likely to change if the independent advisor had the authority to initiate their own investigations? Or is that not really the purpose of having that authority? I, I don't think I'd expect uh, ministerial behaviour to change. Um, I think it's uh, something where it, it, it's relevant to issues where there have been questions about whether ministers have or haven't adhered to the code. I, I, it doesn't seem to me that that would necessarily make a change in how ministers behave. Mm. I agree with that. I, I don't think it would necessarily change the way ministers behave, but I think it would um, give a very significant reassurance to the public. And moreover, what it does for a minister is it, it places the, um, uh, the investigation of uh, the complaint in a, in a sort of independent quasi-judicial context. It's, it, it takes it out of the, you know, the immediate um, political maelstrom um, and, and uh, 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 it gives the minister some assurance of a, a demonstrably fair process, an unbiased process. Um, and I think these are things which are of an advantage to, to ministers, as it were, and which, um, as well as the uh, the reassurance which um, uh, an independent involvement uh, gives to the public um, that due process um, uh, and fair and objective judgment and a sense of proportion in the assessment of different complaints is being applied um, in each case. Thank you very much. Can I ask finally about resources? Uh, uh, at the moment, as we understand it, the investigation that might be initiated will be resourced by whatever is provided by the Cabinet Office to assist the independent advisor to carry out that investigation. Has that caused difficulty? Uh, is there scope for how the Cabinet Office ever choked off resources or restricted them in a way that has made it more difficult for you to carry out an investigation? And does the position on resources, in your view, necessarily have to change if uh, the independent advisor were able to initiate their own investigations? Sir Alex, perhaps if I ask you to start uh, on I that mean, one. I've always felt extremely well supported by the propriety and ethics team in the Cabinet Office. Um, I've never had any issues about, uh, as you said, trying to choke off uh, uh, my, any action I took. And, and indeed, the team in the Cabinet Office who actually did a lot of the groundwork in investigations were excellent and uh, really thorough in what they did. Um, and I think the Propriety and Ethics team is in a good position to support the independent advisor because it's them who provide advice to departments when asked about the operation of the code. And so they are well placed to support the independent advisor. Um, I think, I mean, there are lots of precedents of independent bodies being supported by the Cabinet Office or by civil servants on secondment. I mean, your committee indeed is one, uh, but there are others, ACABA, the Civil Service Commission, Public Appointments Commissioner, and indeed from one of my earlier roles, the um, Intelligence and Security Committee is supported by civil servants on secondment. Um, so I, I've never faced a problem in this. Clearly, if there were a change that uh, the independent advisor could initiate investigations, there'd be an issue about the amount of resources that could be required. And um, 
I think that um, there might need to be more resources provided, um, probably through the propriety and ethics team. Thank you. Sir Philip? It's not proved for me. I agree with Alex. It's not proved an issue in practice or problem in practice. Um, uh, the, I don't doubt that um, uh, through the secondment process, the, the right resources can be made available at the right time. Certainly, you don't want the advisor sitting there waiting for complaints to come with a team of people waiting to uh, deal with them um, and twiddling their thumbs meanwhile. So, uh, but I think flexibility available in the civil service arrangements will overcome that difficulty. Thank you very much. And the last point, just to make sure we understand what is a problem in your view and what is not. Has there been an issue, uh, is there substantively an issue with provision of the necessary evidence or information to the independent advisor in carrying out an investigation? Has that ever been an issue in your experience? Absolutely not. Um, I mean, when they, uh, as I say, I mean, the Cabinet Office, uh, the providing ethics team do a lot of the groundwork on investigations and I've never had any problem. I've always found that the uh, person who was doing the investigations kept me fully in touch, um, provided me with all the evidence I could possibly want. So I've absolutely no problem there at all. Thank you. So Philip, do you share that opinion? Yes, and the, the advisor, of course, is in constant interaction, if there is an investigation, with um, the officials who may be making discrete inquiries of individuals or government departments and so on. And so, you know, it's not that the advisor is simply sitting there taking whatever is the product um, and, and then assessing it. They are actively involved when there is an investigation and ensuring it squares off the issues that they think need to be addressed. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. That, that's all I have, Chair. I think Manisha is, is next. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Sir. Good morning. Hi, Sir Philip. Um, I have, um, I have very, uh, a few short questions. This is more about the end of the investigatory process. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your view about uh, whether it is right that the advisor can only advise the prime minister on whether or not they believe um, that the ministerial code has been broken and that the actual final dis uh, discretion on the finding of the breach is solely a matter for the prime minister. What is your view, Sir Alex? Well, I think as I said a moment ago, and the key point is it must be the prime minister who decides on the sanctions I mean, the, the current position, as you say, is that the judgment on whether the code is breached is a matter for the prime minister, taking account of the advisor's findings and advice. And I mean, I look back at the last time I found that point explicitly discussed was um, in 2006, when both uh, a PASC report and the government response said it must be for the prime minister to judge whether the facts amount to a breach of the ministerial code. I can see a case for saying that the advisor should deal with the facts of whether the, the actions amount to a breach and, as I say, the Prime Minister is then decides what to do. I think this has got muddled up with the issue of whether a breach automatically means a Minister has to resign. Um, I mean, currently, if the Prime Minister feels that the circumstances don't warrant a ministerial resignation, um, he may nonetheless feel under pressure to say that what happened wasn't a breach of the code because he doesn't think the minister needs to resign. So I think it would help if there were a clear uh, range of actions that could be taken following a breach. Thank and you. There's interesting things about the difference with the um, way things are done in Parliament that Philip may have a view on. Um. Well, just to, just to add on, on that point, and I agree in, strongly with what Alex said about, um, you know, A, the ultimate responsibility of the Prime Minister, as it's his code, and B, um, with the need for uh, um, a, 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 the Prime Minister to be the judge in, in terms of the sanction. And, and actually, that's very similar to what happens in Parliament, because you remember that the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards expresses a view um, reaches what I've always called an indicative finding on whether or not the House of Commons code has been breached. But that view can be overturned by then having presented his or her report to the 
Standards Committee of the House, the, the Standards Committee can differ from that view, um, uh, uh, as well, of course, as deciding um, on what sanction to recommend to the, to, to, to the House itself. So it's not that different, in fact, from the parliamentary arrangement. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, there's an echo. If I may just turn briefly to the process of publishing the advisor's findings. Um, is that, that is at the Prime Minister's discretion, is it not? And I, I, I suppose the question is, should, should the advisor have the independent ability to publish the results of their investigation? The Philip. Well, I, I mean, I do think that the advice should always be published. And in my experience, it always has been. Um, I mean, it's, it's most often been a summary of a rather fuller set of advice, but the summary was always cleared with me and I was always perfectly happy with what it said and that it presented the, my views quite clearly. Um, I mean, there clearly sometimes will be a need for redactions where um, the advice contains information that's sensitive perhaps because of individuals who've given evidence in confidence. But um, I, I do feel that it should always be published. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and I mean, there may sometimes be a delay because the Prime Minister quite understandably needs time to consider what to do. But at the end of the day, as has always happened in my experience, it should be published. Sir Philip? Yes, and uh, I agree that it should be published. Um, and uh, the sensible time to publish it is when the Prime Minister um, uh, delivers their verdict, if you like, their judgment on um, whether they agree with the advisor the code has been breached and whether they agree, you know, what the sanction then will be. Um, that's the optimum moment. So would you think that that is, the, that is an area for improvement, that there, that there should be, that, that, uh, that the advisor should have an independent ability to publish it? Well, I think uh, it, it's the word I'd, um, I'm not sure about is independent ability to, to publish it. It's, it's an area where there should be a very strong expectation stroke convention that, the as, there is, as happens in the case of the House of Commons, that the um, uh, uh, Parliamentary Commissioner's report is published alongside the report of there's an appendix to uh, the Standards Committee's uh, uh, report. Um, and my belief is that um, you know, that should be the firm understanding um, in relation to the reports of the independent advisor. That um, I, I, don't think, I don't think the independent advisor can fire off, publish their report as it were, um, ahead of people knowing, okay, so what's going to happen about this? <laughs> um, um, so I think there's two things need to be handled together. I, I mean, interestingly, both the Scottish and the Welsh codes do actually say the findings of the independent advisor will be published, um, which, as I say, I think in practice is the position under the United Kingdom code. Thank you. Thank you. That was all from me, Chair. Thank you very much. Jane, I think you want yes. to come in. Yes, indeed, if I may. Thank you. Um, I, I just have two questions which are around the terms of office for the independent advisor, um, and I, I'll, I'll combine them together, if, if I may. So uh, we, I would be interested in, in both your views on um, the current process for appointing the independent advisor, you know, bearing in mind the authority that is required, and also if you feel there are sufficient protections for the advisor against political interference. Um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis appointment and indeed, um, uh, you, know, uh, what's the, you know, disposal, shall I say, you know, uh, is, is, the, is there, are there sufficient protections for the advisor against political interference in relation to their role? Sir Alex? Well, if I could say, I, I, I wasn't aware of any particular process when I was appointed. I was simply asked, would I be interested in taking on the role? I mean, it's perfectly possible that it's now being considered in the context of the appointment of my successor. And I mean, Philip and I appeared before the parliamentary committee on, in 2012, just after I was appointed. And I was pressed very hard on whether I could be truly independent given my background in the civil service. And one of the then members of the committee, uh, Priti Patel asked me 
do you feel in your current role that you're actually able to challenge those around you, including the Prime Minister, if you hear or see of anything untoward that needs to be drawn to his attention? And the report at the end of the day was very critical of my independence or whether I could be independent. Um, I, I mean, I think it is very uh, important both that the Prime Minister has confidence in the advisor, but also that the public has confidence in his or her impartiality. And I think that can be done with a suitable process, um, as indeed the Public Administration Select Committee has, I think, twice recommended. I mean, if you look at permanent secretary appointments, it's absolutely crucial that the ministers have confidence in their permanent secretaries. But there is a process for appointment of them, which is overseen in that case by the Civil Service Commission. So I, I think it would be possible to devise a, a slightly more formal process for appointing the independent advisor. I mean, perhaps I can leave Philip to answer the other parts of your question. Thank you, Sir Philip. Um, I, I, uh, my experience was like uh, Alex's. I, I actually was approached by Gordon Brown as to whether I would um, be the independent advisor or consider that and, um, and agreed. So, it was, uh, and I strongly agree with Alex that there needs to be a relationship of trust between um, the prime minister, which was a cabinet secretary and the independent advisor. That, um, but I also agree with Alex that the process could be uh, made more transparent and f formalized um, um, in the way that he's, he's suggested. Um, perhaps you could remind me what was the, the, what, what the other points that you'd want me briefly to address. Uh, uh, well, I mean, it was your view on the, current, on the process broadly, which I think you've given us, and then the point about uh, are there sufficient protections against political interference? I'm thinking in particular in terms of appointing or indeed dismissing of an independent advisor. I mean, it, it strikes me as you're talking that there are, you know, the, the, the process is not perhaps as clear, uh, as formal and therefore as clear as it might need to be. And so, for example, you know, some, some would say, well, you know, you need to have a, a non-renewable five-year term, for example. You know, I mean, I've worked as an ombudsman and, you know, you get your seven-year term, et cetera. You will be aware of that. Um, uh, you know, should the advisor be appointed by the House of Commons? Uh, Recognising, of course, your point about trust, absolutely. That, uh, you know, uh, but nonetheless, there are things that might be done. But, and I'm interested to know if you feel there is a, you know, a, a real need for it, uh, or is it just something that might be good in terms of transparency? No, I'm. I, I at the end of the day, um, I wouldn't be in favour of the House of Commons, um, you know, making the appointment or. Um, I think both Alex and I have appeared. Um, uh, I appeared shortly after my appointment before PASC. Um, uh, yeah. Actually, um, uh, we we haven't formally adopted, as it were, um, uh, uh, approval uh, confirmation hearings is the phrase I think yeah. um, in in the in the UK system. But uh, both Alex and I did make such appearances and were asked about you know various questions which related to our degree of independence. Um, uh, but I wouldn't be in favour of, of, of um, giving the, the House of Commons a formal role in the process, because at the end of the day, this is you know, the line between executive and legislature and the need for the prime minister of the day to have um, confidence. Um, I don't feel that the uh, and I was never myself felt subject to political pressure or. Um, whatever. And um, frankly, um, you know, one of the key requirements in a regulator, as you know well from having been an ombudsman, is that they're resilient um, and at the end of the day um, are prepared to walk if they um, uh, uh, feel that their judgment has been called into question or that the relationship between them and the person they're responsible to um, uh, has in some way been undermined. And, um, and, and that's... Uh, um, you know, at the end of the day, what you have to do. Thank you. Very much. Uh, thank you, um, Jonathan. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one last question from me on the ministerial code, and then I'm going to widen out just for the last couple of moments. Um, we have noted as a committee the very significant uh, steps in the direction of independence in the procedures for conduct in Parliament, both in the Commons and uh, increasing now in the House of Lords as well. Um, do you feel that the Ministerial Code and the arrangements for supporting it have got left behind 
when you compare it with the uh, way in which progress has been made in the House of uh, Commons and in the House of Lords. Alex? I want to start on that. I think um, if I'm being asked to start, um, uh, Alex uh, reeled off earlier um, a number of improvements that have been made in standards regulation um, in government since you know, 2007, eight onwards. Um, and no doubt there are, I mean, I think there are practical ways which have emerged in the course of this um, evidence session in which the arrangements can be further improved. I'm not clear how um, introduce uh, what shape an independent element would take beyond, as it were, the independence of the advisor themselves. Um, you are dealing um, uh, here with, you know, in a government with the need to ensure um, the integrity in the ethical sense, but also in the sense of coherence of an administration um, and introducing too many independent uh, elements into the mix could seriously undermine the ability of the prime minister and the cabinet secretary, I think, to actually manage the system. Um, now, managing the system, the system, as I think Alex and I have indicated, can be improved and could be improved in ways which would actually help prime minister and cabinet secretary to manage the system, in my judgment. Um, uh, and I would focus my attention, frankly, on those areas um, and gradually, in an evolutionary way, as has happened in both Houses of Parliament, further developments and improvements may arise. So that would be my, my overall assessment, if you like. So Alex, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, the only thing I would add is that I think that the changes and the developments that have been made in the parliamentary codes have actually meant that there is, as far as I'm aware, very little concern about the operation of those codes and uh, the uh, standards which uh, they deal with. Um, whereas I think as we've discussed, and as you, I think, set out in your uh, UK lecture, as I said at the beginning, there are concerns expressed about the ministerial code. And I do think that some of the uh, issues we've been discussing today could actually help the prime minister uh, and help the public confidence of the ministerial code. So, uh, I mean, to that extent, I do think there are the way that the parliamentary codes have developed has actually helped uh, confidence in the systems there. May I just add one point about the five-year term? I mean, this is something which I um, argued for in, um, in relation to the Parliamentary Commissioner role when uh, the, your own committee looked into the parliamentary arrangements in the wake of my, um, my own appointment and the circumstances which preceded that. Um, I, would, I think you'd need an important caveat in relation to if you went for a five-year time term for the um, independent advisor, which is that um, uh, it would be for a, a, a term or um, reviewable, uh, sorry, it would need to be reviewed if there was a change of administration. There is something more personal about the relationship between the independent advisor and the Prime Minister the, through the Cabinet Secretary than there is in relation to the role of the Parliamentary Commissioner in the House of Commons. Um, and, and, and therefore, I think it, it, then it, it, the, the incoming Prime Minister needs to have the opportunity to say, yes, I'm very content for X or Y to continue. And in 99% of cases, they would no doubt do so. If, um, however, they came in and were not sure about whether this person had the right qualifications, um, then they should have the opportunity to um, make a change, which, of course, they would have to justify. Um, in the court of public opinion and no doubt um, to Parliament and perhaps even to yourselves. So that's the one caveat I would offer to the five-year rule. So first and foremost, thank you very much indeed. Uh, that evidence is extremely helpful from our point of view and uh, we are grateful for your time this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to, to give evidence to you.